the difference between a director who has really prepared and really has a point of view and really has a vision and also can communicate it. That's an awful lot to ask. Today's show is sponsored by Enigma Elements. As filmmakers, we're always looking for ways to level up production value of our projects and speed up our workflow. This is why I created Enigma Elements, your one-stop shop for film grains, color grading LUTs, vintage analog textures like VHS and CRT images, smoke, fog textures, DaVinci Resolve presets, and much more. After working as an editor, colorist, post, and VFX supervisor for almost 30 years, I know what film creatives need to level up their projects. Check out enigmaelements.com and use the coupon code IFH10 to get 10% off your order. I'll be adding new elements all the time. Again, that's Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, elements.com. Well, guys, today we are starting our coverage of the Tribeca Film Festival, and our first guest is amazing. We have the legendary Kira Cedric, who you might know from the television show The Closer and starring in Phenomenon with John Travolta and many, many, many other films and television shows over the years. Now, in this episode, we sit down and talk about how Kira was able to jump from from front of the camera to behind the camera as a producer, director, and we talk about her adventures trying to make her new independent film, Space Oddity. So let's dive in. I'd like to welcome to the show, Kira Cedric. How are you doing, Kira? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've I've been a fan of yours since my days of the video store, where I was where I was moving pirates around, and <laughs> yes, pirates. That was amazing. I love that. I love yeah. that. So, you I mean, you've had you've you've had an amazing career, and you've worked with some remarkable people. But before we get into all of that, and especially your new film, which I I got to chance to see which i loved space odyssey uh space oddity um how did you get started and why did you want to get started in this insane business oh as an actor yes Uh, (laughs) yeah you know what i i fell in love at 12 i did a play uh in eighth grade um fiddler on the roof Mm -hmm. and i played seidel and matchmaker, 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 match. I mean, forget it. I was, that was it. I mean, truly, like I was not a happy kid. I had a very challenging um, childhood and home life. And that was like swoosh. I mean, that was it. Like I knew this was where I felt I didn't even have the words for it at the time, but I remember saying, I feel like my soul has left my body and it's dancing around the stage. <laughs> and then like to this day, I feel like that is such a great, that's such a great explanation of the way that I description of the way that I felt and how it's so interesting to think that as it, as I kept acting, you know, forever and it became a vocation and it became something I, I have to be good at. And then after success and I was supposed to be good and then I was supposed to be better. And then, and then that it sort of lost that initial like love story that brought mm-hmm. me in it to the, in the beginning. And then subsequently like falling in love with directing in that same way. It's like, oh my God, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, this is what I've been supposed to be, you know, I've been training for since I was 16, you know, Um, because I started working professionally when I was 16. So I knew I wanted to be an actor at 12. I worked really hard up until 16. And then I, you know, got my first gig and that was really it. Now, what was it like your first day walking on the set of your first professional, I'm going to get paid to act day? Oh, on the day that I was going to get paid to act. Um, God, you know, I had like that stupid beginners, like, uh, ego about it. Like, I mean, I knew, I knew (laughs) it's very clear that being an an actor because I was trained well is a service position because it really is, you know, I mean, it may later become something else when you become more powerful and have actually people actually care about what you think. But initially like, you're there to serve, you know, you're there to serve the writer, most of all, and then serve the director. And so I think I felt um, incredibly stoked, but I also felt like, 
of course I'm doing this. This is what I, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I really did know that at 12. I mean, like I wasn't going to take no for an answer. Although I guess I think I thought if I, if I try this for six years, try to get a job for six years and it doesn't pan out, I'm going to have to do something else, but I was going to give it a good six years. <laughs> six years. That's, a, that's not a bad amount of time. Some, some people get to Hollywood. I'm going to give it a good year. I'm like, man, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it's going to take a little longer than that. Now, uh, one one of my favorite films of yours, you have so many that I, I've loved of yours um, from singles and so many others, but Phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I, absolutely. I mean, when you were on that set and you were working with John Travolta and that there was some magic about that movie yeah. and your and your performance opposite of John was so riveting you balanced his performance as a a character so well Mm -hmm. what did what was it like on set when you when you were when you when you read that story for the first time yeah I really liked the story it was funny I remember I really liked the story and I also got offered simultaneously like a big horror movie I can't tell you what it was so I don't remember but I remember John Turtletaub you know, being like, but I want you to be in my movie. And, and, you know, um, and I read, I mean, I love the movie and I loved the part. Um, you know, the other one was sort of my movie, albeit it was a horror movie, but, you know, of course I was going to do phenomenon. You know, I knew it was something special when I, when I went to meet with John Travolta for the first time and his his heart is just so big. Like his heart is so big. I know, you know, maybe you don't know him or people don't know that about him, but it's like, he's so, and he's so porous and he's so vulnerable and like his strength is in his vulnerability. There was just something, and he was so in love with this story and so, so attached, so committed to making it, you know, real and, um, and having it, um, you know, have, um, so much integrity, he has so much integrity and it, and it, it's about this sort of fantastical thing that happens, but he was so committed to making it, to, to making it grounded. Mm-hmm. Also, John Turtletaub is like the one of the funniest people on the planet. And he also has a big heart and loves really big. And so I just thought, I felt like I'd really be taken care of. And I also felt the story would be taken care of. And I loved it. I absolutely loved working on that piece. And my daughter was two at the time. And my Kevin had Travis and I had Sosi. And she would come to the set a lot. John Turtletown was so in love with her. I don't know. It was just like a very loving place. And like a family. Um, yeah, it really was. And that doesn't always happen, especially not with a monumental star like that. I mean, that was insane. But also we all really were committed. We knew we had something special and we wanted to like, you know, we wanted to make it great. And he did. They did. We did. There was a, it's a phenomenal, no, no, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> really take. wonderful, really, really fun movie. Now, after working on, on set for so many years and during your career, uh, what made you say, you know, I think I think I want to get behind the camera. I want to get behind the lens. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I I I've always <laughs> I always have an opinion. Um, so I think that, you know, it really it was my husband, my beloved husband, who was like, you know, honey, you really should think about directing. You really should think about directing. And I was always like, you know, I was was terrified of the concept because I thought I wouldn't be you know, I'd work with great, great directors. And then I'd work with not great directors who will never be great. You know what I mean? And it's like very clear, you know, (laughs) the the vast cavernous, you know, difference between the two, two things, you know, and, and so I was afraid I was going to be, you know, the latter and, and I didn't want that crushing blow to my ego, frankly. And, and I, I, so I, I, and I also, I didn't see it a lot, you know? I mean, here's the truth of it, right? It's like, as a woman started in, you know, acting professionally in 1984, 81, no, 1981. Like I didn't see a lot of women, of right. people with a vagina directed, you know? And it was like, when you don't see it, you don't know that you can dream it or be it, right? So, but having said that, it was my husband who was like, you know, kind of goosing me along. And then, you know, I had, I, I'd been producing since I was 27. I did my first movie, you know, in 20, in when I was 27 that I produced and we got Helen Mirren and I was in it and Sandra Bullock was in it and, and, 
uh, it, Marissa Tomei, it was amazing. And it was, um, oh no, that was Lover Boy. That was my second thing. My first thing was losing Chase with Helen. And in any case, so I, I had like balls around that. Like I had chutzpah about, you know, I'm going to produce because I know this is a good script and I know actors are going to like it. And I think I'll get a good director. Um, but, you know, directing just seems so terrifying to me and so much responsibility. But then I had this book that I had bought in 2007 um, called Story of a Girl. And we had hired a female writer director to write the script. And we tried to get it made for like 10 years. And, you know, to quote Glenn Close, I wonder why it didn't get made. Maybe it beca because it has girl in the title. Um, but, you know, it took a really long time to get it made. Right. And it was finally time to get it made. I actually walked into Lifetime to talk to them about something else. Else. And, you know, they said, do you have a passion project? And I was like, yeah, I have a passion project it's called Story of a Girl and I want to direct it. And then I was like, who said, who said that? that? <laughs> who said that? I mean, literally, I was like, say what? Did that just come out of my mouth? And then they read it. And like the next day, we're like, we absolutely love this and we'll make it for a little bit of money, not a lot of money. And I was like, I'm up for that. So, you know, it was um, beyond my wildest dreams, you know, I, 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 like I said, I felt like I was in my element. I didn't know until the first day of directing, of actually being on set that I was in my element. Prep was terrifying for me, even though I had been in my head really prepping for this movie for 10 years, I was terrified, rightly so, I think, like, can I do it? Uh, you know, I got my husband there going, of course you can do it. I got these actors who were looking at me like, of course, I think you can do it. Can you? But I, you know, and then literally the first take of the, the, the first rehearsal of the first scene, the first blocking of the first scene, I was like, I've got this, you know, and it was this very like, you know, not, you know, just this ease and this flow. I felt very in the flow. It felt very easy. You know, subsequently, I think it's become harder as again, like that sort of that little girl who's like, my soul is, you know, dancing around. It's like, after a while, your ego does come in and start going like, you really know what you're doing? I don't know, you know what I'm doing? And, you know, and starts to doubt you and compare and despair and all that stuff. But like in that, that, that show, I was like, I've got this. And then we were like, I mean, I can remember one day we showed up on set. There was one day that we had all outside stuff on location and it couldn't rain. And of course it was Vancouver and it was pouring. And I remember everyone was freaking out and I was like, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I don't know where I got that kind of like trust and confidence and faith that like, no matter what, we're going to figure something out. It was amazing. It was an amazing day. We did figure a lot of stuff out, but, the, but the thing is, is that being so much having, you know, I mean, I've spent so many times on set, so much time on set. I know what it's like when it feels like a director has the reins and when they don't and, and how awful and scary it feels like when they don't have the reins and they don't have control. And so that was something that I wanted to emulate, but it came pretty easily for me. And also I had been prepping this movie in my head for 10 years and had been prepping it on location for, you know, six weeks. So um, anyway, I don't know if I even answered no, no, you, you answered your, you answered the question and I, I love the imposter syndrome that came in because of course. every every everybody has it. And I always like bringing that up on the show because a lot of young filmmakers and young screenwriters, and even young actors who are listening. They think that, you know, oh, you're you've made it at a certain point. You don't have that anymore. Henry yeah. Fonda was throwing up right before he went on stage yeah. every every night. Yeah. And he said and he was Henry Fonda. Yeah, so. Right. You said you said that you've worked with great directors and you know what great directors are and you've worked with not so great directors. And and, you know, what is the difference from an actor's perspective? Oh, boy, that's that's really hard because a, because a director can come over and give you a good note and still like the, it doesn't come together well. It doesn't cut together well, um, you know, yeah, because there could be a, there could be a, a, a performance director who doesn't understand the craft of telling a visual story or right. the visuals. It's all visuals and yeah. you're just movable props at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I think it's really but but I can tell you the difference between a director who has really prepared and really has a point of view and really has a vision and also can communicate it. That's an awful lot to ask in one, but it feels so good. Then we're all like making the same movie and we're all, 
you know, again, in the flow and, and, and in the, the, you know, serving the piece as a whole that has a very strong idea and a very strong vision. Like to me, that's a good director. Now, what is some of the biggest lessons you took away from working with some of the legendary directors have you worked with over the years? Uh, you know, is that everybody does it differently. It's very, it's really interesting. You know, um, some people are, you know, super, super hyper focused on detail. And some people are like, just do it again, just do it again. And it, you know, like Kelly Freeman Craig on edge of 17, just to pick someone really recent and some, a female like was very specific, very, very, very specific. Whereas like, Oliver Stone was like, do it again. Or James Ivory, you know, was like, <laughs> it was already painted. The painting, the movie was painted. You were just the brush strokes, and he was the hand doing the brush strokes. So it was like, it, it, you had no, it was so interesting because mm. he, had, he already had it so much in his head that like, no matter what you brought to the table, he would always direct you back into that that version that he had in his head, you know, it's so, it was so, and, and I remember looking at, at Richard, um, Oh God, that great actor. I'm forgetting his name. It wasn't, it wasn't Paul Newman, obviously. And just going like, is it just me? Or is he already painted the picture? And the guy's like, he's already painted the picture. Robert Sean Leonard, he's already painted the picture. And I was like, so what are we even doing here? You know, that's right. He's amazing. You know, it's really interesting because, I, I understand what you mean by that because his movies were so crafted and yes. they were like, mo- they were literally moving works of art. Like it looks like you could hang a frame, every frame you could hang somewhere in a museum. But I never, I was always wondering about how he worked with actors because, you know, some actors like I've had Oliver on the show and oh, he's, God, and Oliver's, he's Oliver. Um, he's Oliver. <laughs> and, I, and he seems to kind of like just do it again, kind of like, and he flows with it. But when you when you have a director that flows with it like that, there's such confidence, and they just understand the craft so much that they're not afraid of what you might bring that might be different. And I'm not saying that James is like that, but James just had it seemed that he just had such a clear idea yeah. that anything that varied yeah. out of that box, he he just like no, this is what I'm doing, and you're just a paintbrush. It's fascinating to me as an actor that must have been extremely frustrating because you like to bring. Obviously, you bring something to the table, right? It was, and then I saw the movie, and it was so fucking amazing that I was just like, really <laughs> I know nothing. But but the other thing is, though that he cast really well, like he knew he. I mean, you know, and I was just listening to Paul um, Thomas Anderson talking about casting really well, you know, and it's like you cast really well, you really have to trust your actors to bring, to bring something special. And, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, I, I can, fl- I can really see it from both sides. Again, being an actor, I can totally see it from both sides because it's like, on the one hand, you know, he cast the perfect people, but he also like kept them in a, in a very strange, a very like, like tight little box. But then someone like Paul Thomas Anderson, like cast really well. And then, just goes like, do it again and try it again and try something different. It really, I think it also, it's so much depends upon how much time you have. It's like, you can go like, let's do it again. I don't think I have it yet, but like, let's do it again. I won't give any direction. But if you only have like four takes that you know until you have to move on, like you have to know people more, you know? And it might make people feel more uptight, but the truth is like, then you hope the director has a plan of like, I know I got this piece in this scene, this piece in, the, you know, this piece in this beginning of the scene. Coverage. Now I just need the middle, and now I, I, but I got the end. Let's just do that little, you know. Or you could, or you could do the Kubrick and just shoot. <laughs> and exactly. But he, but he also a lot of people don't understand that Kubrick shot with like you know thirteen crew members, so he had days and days, weeks and months and, and uh, on eyes wide shut. How long did he have? Like almost a year. I think it's the oh. longest, longest shooting movie in history. I think it was according because he just and locked up Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman for a year. I know. It's so funny. It's like I was thinking, you know, I made my movie in 21 days and <laughs> and, you know, I and I heard 
Paul Thomas Anderson, who I think like made one of the greatest movies. I mean, he's beyond, you know, yeah. um, but he, but, and I was so in love with Licorice Pizza and he was like, I had 65 days to shoot. And I was like, 65, anyone can make a good movie in 65. <laughs> I actually heard myself saying that. I can't believe I said it, but you know, I was like, wait a minute. No. Um, anyway, but it's true. It's like, I think it's more fun for the actors when you have more time and you can be more sure. loosey. I think it is more fun for the actors. Now, how do you approach directing actors, hence being one for so long? Yeah. <sighs> how do I, you know, everyone's different. Um, I think, first of all, you know, making actors or holding a space that feels safe for them is mm-hmm. so key. Like, and that starts from like the first conversation you have with them of like, you know, what do you need? Like, what can I do? But also just, just, making a safe place because actors there's we are so vulnerable it is so terrifying you know having this giant piece of machinery looking at you i mean i I don't know i i just think that every actor is you know ripping themselves open and like you know leaving a piece of their soul on the on the floor for you so like you better honor what that is and i feel like I I know that intrinsically that's not something I had to learn that's something that I you know really really deeply understand so I think that's like first and foremost super important because people I think that they'll feel more people give you better if they feel safe and and um and I think that you know I I've worked with a lot of green actors in my time and I think that it's about specificity um and you know using all the tools in your toolbox as a director and, and, you know, and trying not to, you know, to, to give unactionable notes, you know, like just be faster, just be funnier, you know, that kind of shit is like, not, I mean, I, I really try not to do that unless an actor is just like, you mean faster. Right. And I'm like, yeah, actually that's what I meant. Faster, more intense. Sometimes I definitely do like pace or whatever, but like people need different things. Some people like, you know, are going to nail it on the first or second take. Like Kevin's going to nail it on the first or second take. It's not going to be a warm up. We better be ready. You know, whereas some of the younger actors, it's like they needed a warm up and some of them needed a warm up in the beginning of the movie, but not towards the end of the movie, towards the end of the shoot. Like I've been in a great, I've been, I've had like a front row seat to see actors grow within a movie. Like it's incredible, you know? And then there, so everyone needs something different. Some people, and sometimes, you know, you need to be pushed and pushed, just do it again, do it again. And then they start like questioning themselves to death. And it's like, no more questions. You've got to trust me. Like go again, just do it again. You know, stop watching yourself. Cause a lot of time the actors are watching themselves and it's like, I'm watching you. Try not to watch yourself, like keep going. So when actors are in the scene, I've, when I've worked with actors before, sometimes they get into their own head. Yes. And then once they're in their own head, they're out of the moment yes. and they're thinking about their acting. And then now that's a bad performance. You're not, it, you're not reacting. You're not in the moment. Right. What do you do to knock them out of that? Because it happens all the times. I slapped them really hard across the face. <laughs> no, not I, so, not so much in these days. Seventies, you might have gotten away with that. Not so much now. <laughs> honestly, you know, I, you know, I think honestly, sometimes you take them aside and like, hey, you know, what do you need? Or and be like that loving, like mama bear. And sometimes it's like, stop doing that, you know. And you've got to trust me. Stop it. Like, you know, I think one of Alex's, you know, one of Kyle's greatest performances was when he was feeling the most self-loathing and like I could see it in him you know because I know that feeling of like I suck so bad and it's like you know I just made him do it again and again and again and it's like it's some of the stuff that we use the most in the movie and it's it's the most vulnerable and and you know I just I just tried to like not give him time to be in his head because we didn't have the time so in a way that was a gift right like I can't we all can't indulge this. Like, I'm not going to let you indulge it because I don't think it's good for you, but we all can't indulge this. So let's just keep going. And again, 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 and I don't, he never, he never told me he hated me for it, but really, truly it's, the, it's the stuff that's like interstitially in the movie. It's the stuff when he's looking in the mirror and he, we use it over and over and over again in the movie because, because it helped, it, it, it did something for us that we didn't even know we needed. Um, moments where we were just quiet and landing with Alex and seeing him make a decision to do something different. 
Um, but um, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, it won't mean anything. But 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 the point being that, you know, when he was at his least trusting. And I think that's also the thing that I can speak to as an actor and tell actors. Sometimes when it feels the worst, it's the best. And you right. see, we don't know as actors. We think we know it wasn't good. I always know, but we really don't. We really don't. And that's I can right. reflect that back to them, you know? Yeah. It and just then, because it was good for you doesn't mean it was good for the audience. Just because you really cried doesn't mean that it, you, the, you made the audience cry. It's interesting because when you start listening up stories of like David Fincher or Stanley Kubrick, where he oh just, they do 70, 80, 90. Yeah, I'm not that. I don't think I'll ever be that person, even if that, I had the time. Right, exactly. But I under, I kind of understand the mentality behind it because you're breaking down the actor's mind to the point where they can't think anymore because they've done it so much and they just, and that's where the magic happens in their, their process. Yeah. But if, I believe if you hire a good actor, they should get there faster. Exactly. You know, it's so funny because I worked with Cameron Crowe, obviously. As yeah. I worked with him. And dude, that guy did like 45 takes of everything. And every really? single actor at one point, lo- you know, looked at themselves and went, I must be the worst actor on the planet. And it was so funny because we all felt like I, I talked to Bridget Fonda and I was like, I know he probably doesn't do it to you but he makes me do like 40 takes she's like are you kidding he always makes you do 40 takes but she didn't have that like self-loathing that i was born with so you know so she didn't take it so personally but you know it's so funny because he would come the next day i remember this vividly i don't know if you remember the movie but there's of the course scene, she, her first scene i think it's the beginning of the movie and she's doing the um garage door clicker mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. he has a little like for like a couple of paragraphs and then she clicks the garage he Honestly, 38 takes. And the other thing is that as I'm doing more and more takes, I can feel Cameron spiraling too and being scared that it's terrible. You know, so like I didn't think, so it wasn't just me making that up. Like he actually, and then he would come back the next day and go, dude, dude, had it on like the third take. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. But that was like his second movie. That was like his second movie. But then the next day, I'd be like, okay, cool. So he's not going to make us do so many takes. Same thing. And then he'd be like, dude, dude. Fourth take. (laughs) Second take. I was just like, oh, and then it never changed. So I just think that's him, you know, but, and he's a great, amazing director. His movies are incredible. And that was during the time (sighs) of film where that cost every single time. It wasn't a hard job. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember that very because again, that's the 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 the, the time of my video store days, yes. it, like eighty seven to ninety two, ninety three. I was in the video working at a video store, so singles, say say anything, pirates, mm-hmm. all that time was during those. I'm, <laughs> I'm deadly in trivia in trivia pursuit uh, in that time period. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, um, so. I wanted to ask you too, as an actor, what is the biggest misconception that people have about the process? Because actors from, from the outside, you know, especially young directors, it looks like a, an alien, you know, like how you work on the process and every actor is different, every method and all that stuff. But generally speaking, what do you think is the biggest misconception that the directors or just people in general have about the process of, of being an actor on set? That's a really good question. I mean, off the top of my head that it's easy that people think it's easy. Right. Just do yeah. it. It's, it's, he moved the light. Why can't you just hit the mark and do that? Yeah, I mean, my, my brother-in-law is, a, is a, an eye surgeon and he's like, what you do is so hard. Are you freaking kidding me? Um, and bless his heart, like he does, you know, big work and it's amazing and it's incredible. If I stuck a camera in front of him, he would be like, he would understand very quickly how hard it is, you know? So I think that it's hard is, is a misconception. I think that a lot of people, and also understandably, it's like, you know, you know, actors are sort of treated like gods sometimes eventually. And that's like, really, you're not curing cancer and it's really hard, you know? So I think that that's one of the things, um, 
And again, I just keep coming back to this concept of like, it's really vulnerable. It's really oh, scary. It's so vulnerable. It yeah. is. It's so vulnerable. It's like most of us walk around with like, we've got a shield on all the time. I mean, you know, one way or the other, it's like, there's a front, there's a, there's a, there's something going on that like makes me safe in the world. And, and you're trying, you're really stripping that away ultimately, I think when you're in front of a camera for me or in front of an audience. But if you only feel comfortable, because if you don't feel comfortable from what I, from my experience, when you're, when you're an actor and you don't feel comfortable, you'll protect yourself. And that's when problems occur uh, on, on, on set. So that's what will happen. So when you, that's why safe space is so, so important for a director to come, to come in. Now, as a, as a seasoned actor like yourself, you can pretty much smell it on day one. How long does it take you before you know, oh God, this, this director has no idea what they're doing. Oh, what did I sign up for? I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to carry this myself. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. I think, you know, really early on. Yeah, for sure. Especially at this age. I mean, my God, you know, day one, you'll go, mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, but I also give people a lot of room, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I'm like, OK, you know, this is a new set, like everyone's getting their sea legs, especially on a movie, like on a TV show. It's a little bit different because three quarters of the people are already hired and are doing all the work all over, the, uh, uh, you know, at the same time. But like a movie or the beginning of a series or something like that, everyone is figuring it out and figuring out the flow and, and crews are on unmerged and you know and and so i think that you know that is a you know i i i definitely try to give people the benefit of the doubt for a while um I, you know i may have a spidey sense you know quickly and go like oh that's a little red flaggy but yeah it's okay i can tuck that into the back of my head for you know a minute a minute you know and then and then if days go by and it's just like it's just a clusterfuck then it's just a clusterfuck and you know and you're like okay i just have to protect me you know, in my performance as much as possible. Yeah. And I've, I've seen that happen with, and you can kind of see when, when you see a movie and you see a performances come out and you're like, wow, she's always good, so good in that, or he's always so good. What happened here? And then you hear the stories of behind the scenes. You're like, Oh, they were just protecting themselves. They were just trying to survive the shoot. essentially. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, is there something that you wish someone would have told you at the beginning of your career about like, Hey, you know, keep an eye out for this, or this is not the way it is. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I was born and raised in New York. So I had a lot of street smoke. I, I can so, tell. I can tell. Like, for some people, you know, and I had two older brothers, so I wasn't going to take a whole lot of shit. Like I'd take some, you know, but like, I mean, I remember. <laughs> you were prepped. You were prepped. <laughs> I, yeah. And like, I remember auditioning for Adrian Lyon for line for oh. um, uh, flash dance, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, and I and I had to, you know, I'd go in there and I I started the scene and a fo the phone rang and he went to go pick it up and I was like, you're not going to pick that up, are you? And I literally was like, you know, a baby actor, you know, I was like, I don't know, 17 or something like that. And I was like, you're not going to pick that up, are you? He looked at me like, wow, like he couldn't believe, you know, that I had, you know, just like, I, I think that, um, I, I think that, I think that you have value. I, I, I think telling, you know, telling an actor, you know, it's interesting because I think that on the one hand, you want to say to young actors, like you have value, your opinion matters. But I also think it's so important that actors know, and I somehow knew this intrinsically, that you are there to be of service. You know, you really are there. You know, I, I studied with, with um, teachers who were like, the play's the thing. You know what I mean? Like, you're not the thing. The play is the thing. So I think that that's important for actors to know. And you have value, right? Like both of those things at the same time. It's so interesting because you seem, you know, as we're, ta as we're talking, you know, you've obviously had a fantastic career thus far. You haven't, it doesn't seem from the outside that you've fallen into any of these traps, these ego traps that you've actually mentioned, like, oh, this or that, or you become, or people think you're a god and things. How did you avoid that? Is it just your upbringing in New being a New Yorker? Because I'm an East Coaster as well, so I, I feel you. We can smell our own. So um, what is it about that, that that you didn't fall into those traps? And, and, and also your husband too, Kevin, didn't seem to fall into them either. You know... I think that, um, you know, I think in some ways we have always been and always 
you know, valued being a workhorse actor and not like a star. You know what I mean? I think that we, you know, I think that there's part of me that wished it had been easier for me. I know that one would look at me on the outside and go, God, you've had such a great career, but like, it's been hard, like many times hard and like many years, you know, not working sometimes between jobs, like two years, three years. So like, I think that while I would have liked a softer, easier way, in a way I feel like because it's been challenging, it has made me um, respect and value, um, you know, being a workhorse actor that's like somebody who never had it too easy. I also will say that like, I feel like I'm a for whatever reason, I'm like a good citizen. And I feel like it's important to be a good citizen in the world and to be a good citizen on a set and to like treat people well and treat people the way you want to be treated. And like that kind of diva mentality or thinking that you're better than anybody else, um, anybody, including the freaking, you know, crafty man, if you think you're better than them, then like you're, I, I just, I just think that, that'll end up biting you in the ass, you know, and I, and it's certainly not fun to be around. And it also, there's humility to being an actor. You have to be willing and, and open to learning about human beings. And I think that if you think you're somehow better than any human being, then you're not going to be, you don't, you don't have that humility to observe and to, um, and to become that person and to represent that person on screen. Does that make sense? It makes, it makes all the sense in the world. And, and you're, what you're saying is the, what everyone should strive for. Not everyone gets there, but everyone should strive for that. Just that I'm here. I'm, I'm here for the, for the work. I'm, I'm glad to be working. I had the pleasure of working uh, with uh, Robert Forrester uh, years ago. And and not to drop a name, but the drop reason I'm bringing away, up, my friend. the reason the reason, the reason I'm the reason I'm bringing it up is that when I spoke to him after we worked together, he said, "Actors need to remember that there's this many actors and this many jobs, right? And you should be lucky if you're working to get up and be appreciative and grateful that you get to do what you love to do. Um, and that's what a lot of actors don't understand. And I was like, wow, it was just such a he was like a sage. And when I, when I worked with him, it was like a sage working, talking to me about acting. It was just like, oh. And also, by the way, when he walked on set, he, he was prepared in a oh way that God. he was so prepared course, in a yeah. way that I wasn't used to working because actors I'd worked with, they're good actors and everything, but such an amazing, I was like, oh my God, he's, he's walking in like I'm Quentin Tarantino. This is amazing. That's so, so it's so wonderful when you get to work with really great actors because then you understand what a really great actor can do and bring to your project where, like you're saying, green actors, they haven't gotten there yet. It takes them a little bit of time to get there. Yeah. yeah. Now, tell me about Space Odd Oddity. How did that come to life? By the way, I watched it, loved it. I thought it was wonderful. What an amazing cast, by the way. Oh, amazing Thank cast. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we really we really got lucky. Um, so Space Oddity is a script that was given to me. I think it was 2017, maybe even. Um, and um, I loved it. And uh, and my company, my company, Big Swing, we, um, Valerie Sadler and I worked with the writer for mm, about a year, about a year and a half. And, um, and then, you know, the, the, um, little old pandemic happened. And so we had to push a year. Um, but we, you know, I love the movie. I thought it had something to say. I thought it, it's, it's everything that I love. You know, it's about this family and um, and it's romantic and it's funny and it's sad. And it also has like some climate stuff in it, you know, which I think is so mm -hmm. critical right now and, and important for us as artists and storytellers to, to talk about. Um, and, um, you know, we got the money together, literally like we were in prep when the last money came in. I mean, it was not easy. There was nothing easy about this. You know, we had someone cast as Alex. He fell out like three weeks before we were start, start, supposed to start prep. And then the great gift of Kyle Allen, who's like 
going to be a huge star, you know, came into our lives. And um, we had Madeline uh, Brewer really early on the year before in like 2018, I guess we had her 19. I'm getting my, I'm not good with dates. Um, but, um, and, and a lot of people cast and then, you know, lots of people came in at the last minute. And, um, you know, I was, it's one of those things where, you know, I was bound and we were bound and determined, like we were like not taking no for an answer. I'm making this movie. Like I will do everything I can. To, and I, I become the engine of everything that I do, I find. And that's like a gift and a power of mine, but also it's like sort of the only way I know how to do it. Um, like literally in the middle of the pandemic, I was doing a sitcom. I was starring in a sitcom that only went one season called um, Call Your Mother. And by the way, call your mother, call your mother, always call your mother. Um, and, um, and I was like, I felt so hopeless, like helpless. Like I couldn't, like I wasn't doing, I was in LA, you know, I couldn't do anything here. And this was before we even had our money, you know, this was the summer before we ended up shooting it. But I, I, I was like, I knew I wanted to shoot in Rhode Island because right before March 5th, 2019, we went on a scout in Rhode Island. I knew they had a 30% you know, tax incentive. And I went on a scout with my producing partner, with Valerie. And we were like, this is the place. I found the town. I knew Wickford, Rhode Island was going to be where I wanted to shoot the town. And the town is an important part in, you know, character in the movie. And then I was like, I have to find a flower farm. We didn't find one on that scout. And of course the world shut down. So I was in LA and I start looking up, you know, far flower farms on the computer. Didn't realize that it was the day before Valentine's Day cold called, you know, Robin Hollow Farm, which was this, you know, I looked, I found their website. I looked at their plate. It looked beautiful. So I cold called them and said, hi, my name is Kira Stretching and I'm going to make a movie in Rhode Island this summer. Didn't have the money, didn't have the, all the cat, you know, I was like, but, you know, saying all this stuff. And, and I really love the look of your flower farm and any chance you might want to let us shoot on it. And she goes, and the wife um, uh, who picked up the phone, who owned the flower farm with her husband, Mike said, well, um, you are <laughs> calling a flower farm the day before Valentine's Day. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I hate Valentine's Day. I always thought it was such a stupid holiday. And then I start going to this like thing about Valentine's Day. I was like, what, are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? I was sweating. I was so scared to call, but, but it was, it was like magical. It was so magical because literally the next day, Mike Hutchinson, who owns, um, Robin Hollow got on the phone with me and my um, production designer, Michael, um, Michael, oh my God, I'm forgetting his last name, but I'll remember it. Um, and, and we called him and he was like, I did a show for, I, I did a gardening show with Martha Stewart. And so I know filmmaking, we were like, we couldn't believe how lucky we were. And he sent us a whole bunch of pictures of what the place looks like, you know, when it's in full bloom. And we were like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And this sucker actually, I mean, this really nice guy wants to <laughs> let us shoot there. And, you know, and it, you know, we turned, we ended up shooting there. So it was like, you know, it was, it was amazing. A lot of luck, a lot of perseverance wow. and, you know, great people supporting us. I mean, you know, it takes a village. It takes more than a village. It takes, oh, yeah. My God, it takes a takes a planet. A mir miracle. It takes a miracle. It really <laughs> takes a miracle. The the idea that anything ever gets me. We got turned down by so many financiers. You have no Michael Michael Fitzgerald. I'm so sorry. I had to look yeah. that up. Sure. My God, the, the brilliant, the brilliant Michael Fitzgerald. But there was a lot on that flower farm that is that flower farm. I mean, you could spend millions of dollars trying to get that look and there it was like point a camera and there was I mean, there was a lot of work that michael did a lot of work but it, it was a beautiful place to shoot now um what you've directed a ton of television a ton of television over the years what lessons did you bring from television to your and this is your first feature you direct if i'm not mistaken correct mm -hmm. you, so what were those lessons because television's a whole different beast for than sure. a narrative a feature so what lessons did you bring onto your indie film well i mean i think that you learn so much doing television and different kinds of tv shows like going from like grace and frankie to ray donovan and city on a hill and then you know in the dark and i mean you know I've, i i got to play in everyone else's playground and use everybody else's toys and you know i know it's only the beginning and uh, and I have so much more to learn, but I knew so much more than I did when I did my first movie. Um, so a lot about 
um, how to shoot things, about equipment, um, about gear coverage. Gear like co right, exactly. Or not coverage. I don't know. I'm kind of fast and loose with the coverage. Um, <laughs> we'll take a talk about that another time. But, um, <laughs> you know, trusting that, you know, when you've got it, you're moving on. Like that is something that really came so easily from to me from the beginning but i think it's because of my acting background and knowing like especially all those years on the closure like we have this scene we have this this side anyway or you know and and so that i think is such a huge and and also being under the gun time wise is super important being responsible for budget day all that stuff you know i know that some people never had that problem you know but frankly I love that problem. You know, I mean, I'd love to have more days. Don't get me wrong, universe, like many more days and all that. But like, there is something to momentum on a, on a, on a crew and on a day that, that serves everybody, you know, it serves cast, it serves crew and it serves, you know, producer. I mean, it just serves the piece. So, so learning how to know when I got it, um, also being, spending a lot of time um, on all the shows I did, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time on location blocking and being an actor. It's great because I can do all the parts, but also I could bring in PAs and, you know, other people to come in and be those actors for me so I could set shots and stuff like that. Like all of that stuff. And also like being open to ideas and knowing when to go like, OK, no more ideas. Like now it's me in my head. I mean, the other thing I've really learned about myself as a director, which I've learned through time, is that I have to hear my own voice first without hearing other people's input first. So that's why I like to go on, on, on set, on location, on set early. And I did it on everything from the first um, um, TV show I did. And usually they'll let you like walk the sets and stuff like that. And, and, and going on to the set and, and thinking, okay, oh, this is how this scene should be. This is why it should be, you know, it comes at this time in the show or the, or the movie, it should be this kind of thing. I'm cutting from this to this. So I want, you know, I want to make sure that that works and, and, and spending a lot of time with my own voice so that I can hear the input of other people because it feels good for other people to feel seen and heard. That's also really important. And the other thing I know as an actor, especially on my show, The Closer, people like to hear you say, thank you so much for moving that light. Really appreciate your hustle, you know, when you mm -hmm. fix that sound thing for us. Thanks. Oh, and, and, you know, all that stuff is like so it's so key to, you know, just give people their due, man. And they'll and they will kill and die for you. Am I yep. right? Mm -hmm. you crew that you appreciate them and actors that you appreciate them. They're like, that's it. I'll do anything for you now. I mean, because that, not that feeding them, and that is feeding them well. And that and feeding them well. And feeding them well. Totally. <laughs> that's why I said craft service is not above you. <laughs> no, no, crafty is crafty could kill you. You put a bunch of sugary, bunch of sugary stuff on that table, and okay. it's an eighteen-hour day. About twelve hours in, everyone's like sugar high. Fights break out. I've seen it happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's insane. <laughs> Now, as a director, we all go through that. You know, we all understand the the the, the battle of making your day, making you know, cat, making sure your film gets done, project gets finished on time. But there's always that one day. Yeah, there's that thing. Camera breaks. Actor it, it, car car broke down. I'm losing the light. What was that day for you? What was the worst day? And how did you overcome that obstacle as a director? Shit. I know that we had a bunch of days where we were supposed to shoot something and the lightning would start <laughs> and oh. everything would stop for 30 yeah. minutes and we had to come back, you know? And I think that, I think that the thing to do is to, Oh, I remember, Oh, this was, a, this was a really good day to talk about because me and the actors weren't gelling. It was like, they were mad at me, which, which for an actor director, it's like, what do you mean you don't like me? I'm one of the <laughs> tribe. I mean, seriously, it's so, and I remember it first with, with an actor and I wish I could say his name, but I'm not going to on Grace and Frankie because all the actors were like, we love you, Karen. We love you. And I was like, they all love me because, you know, I'm an actor. And of course they love me. And this one actor was like, I don't love you. I don't love you at all. In fact, I think you're annoying. And I was just like, say what broke my heart. Um, and I, but you know, 
I was telling him to do something he didn't want to do or whatever, you know? Um, but that day, not only did that happen where I felt like I was asking for something, I can be very exacting, like a very exacting director. Like I, because I feel like I really know what I want. And if I'm not getting it and I'm losing the light, I'm sure I know I can get, you know, I think I'm covering, but I'm not that good an actor sometimes. Hard to believe. I know I'm only kidding. <laughs> but um, anyway, so this day, it wasn't a good day anyway. We had so much to do. And it was this big emotional, it was that big emotional scene in the fire for the fireflies where he's like talking mm-hmm. about his brother. And it's like, it's such a huge scene. It was such an important scene. And it was such a beautiful location. And I, and I was so, it just, nothing was happening right. We were losing light before we could ever make this day. It was an insane day. We never could have made it anyway, but then thank God the heavens opened up and the lightning came and the rain and we had to shut down. And I remember going, you know what? Every time we hit those moments, it always ended up being a gift in the end. And so I had to start learning to just trust that, even though that was so hard for me because I really do, I like to stick to a plan, you know, but of course, you know, you have to let go of that plan. <laughs> but, but, and, and also there is, I mean, you always think like, there's no way we're going to be ever be able to come back to this location. And then something happens and you are able, able to go back. Like, you know, Again, it's like about right sizing things. Like, you know, it's, it's, I know it feels like this is my movie, but it is just a movie. Like, you're going to figure it out. Like, you know, and no one needs to get hit by lightning. And like, <laughs> you know, no one needs my bad attitude on that day or like my forcing a solution when like there's no solution to be had. The person's just not in the mood to take my direction today. You know what I mean? So it was, ended up being a blessing, but it was hard to go there. Right. Because, I mean, as a director, directing is compromise. Every day, every every moment, it's it's just compromise constantly. Except for David Fincher, I really feel like that dude <laughs> never. I no, honestly, no. And when you hear him talk, he's like, "I would never do that. I'm just an asshole, and I know it. Like, I'm just really tough." Oh no, he's, I, he's he's so cool. open about it. It's like amazing, and I've never worked with him, and we'd love to. And I'm just <laughs> and, and, and now I just but, said that, but no, no, but I don't think he compromises. Do no, you? I think it was, it, it was, um, no, I agree with you a hundred percent. I don't think David compromises at all. I don't think Nolan compromises, um, but they're playing in such different sandboxes. I mean, you're talking, I mean, Kubrick never compromised. Who, all and men, by the way, just three men just want to mention, but anyway, go on. Right, right. But they don't generally compromise because right. they are who they are yeah. and that's the way they, but they've built that thing about them that they can do things like that i promise you that uh david did compromise on alien 3 his first feature which he had taken away by by a studio and then after oh yeah oh, that's a whole long story i mean i could go on and on about oh yeah he was he was he never wanted to direct again. he wanted to just say i'm not gonna go do features anymore i'm just gonna go back to commercials and then seven came around and then he's like i if you're gonna i'm gonna do it my way and and then after that, then he he start writing his ticket. Same thing for Nolan and wow. Kubrick. Kubrick wrote a ticket that it, nobody's ever written before. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's remarkable. Now yeah. I had to, I do have to ask you because yeah. I th- this is this is uh, this is a story I heard that you told, and I think the audience would get a big kick out of it because I couldn't stop laughing. It's your Tom Cruise story. <laughs> yeah. Please tell the audience the Tom Cruise story because it's absolutely hilarious. It's a good one. So, you know, Tom and I did Born on the Fourth of July together. So we kind of knew each other. And then Kevin did A Few Good Men with him. And I was seven months pregnant on A Few Good Men. And um, and back then, they didn't have nice-looking maternity clothes. This has nothing to do with the story, but just, just as a vision of what I look like. And <laughs> so we got in, we, we would keep getting invited to, like, events with, like, Tom and Nicole, who he was with at the time, and Demi Moore was in the movie, and so Bruce came. And then, like, and then Kevin, um, oh, remind me, what's his last name? Pollock. Kevin Pollock, thank you. And then, like, you know, throwing for a good measure, like, Billy Crystal would come. And then Rob Reiner, you know, and it was like, we got invited to cool things. We got invited over to, to Tom Cruise's house for dinner. It was a lovely meal. After dinner, we all retired to the library where the men smoked cigars and the women chatted. And I do what it's like I do. Titanic. It's like Titanic. I know. Well, what I tend to do is, and I couldn't drink, I couldn't smoke, you know, because I was pregnant. So I was like, 
looking at stuff. You know, I looked at like a, like a photo album of Tom and Nicole skydiving. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then like looking at the mantelpiece, there was like a little, you know, a fireplace. And I was looking at the mantelpiece, the pictures. And then underneath the mantelpiece, weirdly, like oddly placed was this little button. And I was like, I wonder what that is. And, you know, maybe if I pressed it, like the door, like the thing would shift and like we'd go into some secret place. And so I just pressed the button and nothing happened. And I thought, hmm, that's a little unsettling that nothing happened. Maybe, you know, I'm just going to mention it to Tom. So I tapped Tom on, Tom on the shoulder, who's like mid story, you know, on something. And he turns around and I go, I just pressed that button under there. Um, and he goes, you press that button? And I said, oh, yeah, I did. I pressed that button. And he goes, that's the panic button. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. And he goes, why did you press that button? And I was like, I don't know. It was there. It was just there, you know? And the cops came. <laughs> like, 12 cop cars came. We were supposed to watch The Godfather 1 and 2. We had to postpone the screening because at first he just told his assistants to tell them he was fine. They wouldn't leave, understandably, until they saw Tom Cruise, like, in one piece. And so he's like, oh, yeah, sorry, I have to go upstairs because someone pressed the panic button. <laughs> And the cops are upstairs. They won't leave. So we got to hold on the movie. I mean, it was mortifying and we didn't get invited back. And, and, what, and by the way, what did Kevin do during this time? He was like, what did you do? Why would you do that? And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, what? I just, I can't believe you did that. What were you thinking? You know, he was, he was just completely like on the one hand mortified and shocked. But on the other hand, like, that's so you, you just do that kind of shit. Like just, there's a button. I'm just going to press it. You know, I'm a little I, impulsive. I think you're a victim of your industry, which is the movie industry. And you've seen way too many movies. And when you hit that button, <laughs> cool stuff happens in movies. Right. Of course. They're just not a panic button. They're just something opens. You go into a secret passage. You find the, the Ark of the Covenant. There's things that happen. So I'm, I'm with you, Kira. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I, I'm completely with you. I probably... I'm not sure if I would have touched the button, but boy, would I have got close. <laughs> yeah, you'd be really curious. I would. But I'm imagine, bold. I just went right there. But imagine if you hit the button and a door opened and you'd be like, oh, hell, what would you have done? You're like, Tom, Tom, the <laughs> dungeon is uh, v- visible for everybody. <laughs> Dungeon where you, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but uh, Kira, uh, where can people, uh, when is this coming out? I know you're at Tribeca right now. And what, what, by the way, what was it like? What was it like getting that call? I always oh don't ask. God, that. It was so great. It was so, so, so great. Actually, it was kind of, um, a kind of anticlimactic because I called Jane because I hadn't heard. And I know Jane uh, Rosenthal. And, you know, I was like, this isn't right. You shouldn't call her. And then I was like, you know what? No stone unturned. Like you got to do it. You know, <clears throat> call her. and I just wanted to tell her how passionate I was about, you know, my hometown of New York and what I felt about the Tribeca Film Festival, just the way I feel like it's a, it's like a, you know, I mean, it was, it was conceived as like New York coming back from 9-11. And I kind of feel like I'm reinventing myself. And like, I don't know. I just was like, I had this whole spiel to give her, you know? And then I was like, hi, Jean. Thank you so much for taking my call. You know, I just wanted to just one more, you know, just once again, tell you how passionate she's like, oh, sweetie, you know, you did such a great job. We absolutely want to have you. I'm so sorry it's taken us so long. And I was like, yeah, but I got a spiel. I got a whole thing <laughs> and about the Phoenix riding from the ashes. But anyway, no, I mean, I'm so grateful because the truth is like, I think this movie can play in a theater. I think it should play in a theater and it probably won't or may not due to the, like the world that we live in. It'll, you know, I mean, I would love to have a window of theatrical anyway, no matter what. So, um, but I think that people seeing it in an audience, it's, it's a joyful, meaningful movie about love and loss at a time and fighting for like what's here at a time when I feel like we're all feeling loss and wanting to fight for something, you know, better and different and, and, and within our means and within our grasp to fight for. So I think that, I think it's an important movie. It feels like a, and it's fun and it's entertaining and it's, and it's romantic and it's about love and like fighting the good fight and, you know, and grief. And I just think, God, who can't relate to that? 
Absolutely. Well, I am I am so happy that you made the film. It's a fantastic film. I hope everyone goes out there and sees it. Uh, Kira, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. It's been so entertaining and so much fun. Thank you. And, and best of luck, continued success and uh, go out there and tell some more great stories. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.